right. Uh, we're going to hear a presentation from Matt Ranella now. He's a research ecologist with the USDA. Um, Fort he, with the USDA Fort Keo Livestock Livestock and Range Research Laboratory in Miles City. His research focuses on rangeland restoration and weed management. So, yeah, please welcome Matt. I couldn't figure out what was going on with the laser pointer, like with the red and the, I felt like I was like, it was 1980 and I was at the roller rink uh, playing asteroid. Um, so I'm going to give two little talklets today. Uh, the first one is about some mine reclamation research I've been involved with. And then the second one is on the theory underpinning seed mix design. I've been involved in coal mine reclamation seeding research for well over a decade now, I guess. And the goals in my work have been to increase seeded species diversity increase shrub and forb abundances and reduce weed abundances. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some projects that have this, these things as the goals. The first thing I did was uh, with a team went and measured plant abundances on over 300 fields on these mines in Montana and Wyoming. Uh, for two years, so two summers in a row, we measured these fields, the vegetation that was on them. And then we got, we compiled all of the mines data on the fields, soil depth, seed mixes, seed rates, uh, cover crop use, et cetera, et cetera, and tried to like analyze this data, to try to figure out what are the unifying characteristics of fields that look okay versus ones that are weed patches. Um, and just very briefly, here's the one of the big findings from that was that we figured out that as the cool season grass seed rate increases, so that's these grasses here and some others, the ratio of weeds annual weeds to seeded grasses decline. So if you don't seed any of these, annual weeds will outnumber seeded grasses three to one in terms of cover, or 2.8, you see there. And these are confidence intervals in the, in the parentheses. And that, but if you, then as you increase the grass seed rate into this range, zero to 3.5 pounds per acre, the weed abundance is cut in half and then if you increase further, you get a little bit of a reduction in weeds, but not much. Uh, but then if we look at shrubs, uh, the picture's a little different. You get more shrubs, there's one unit of shrub cover for every 10 units of seeded grass cover when you seed zero of these aggressive grasses. And it's still the case that you have one unit per 10 if you get into this low rate range, but then if you get above that range with these aggressive grasses, then the shrubs tank. Okay, so this is the first thing I did. There's experiment, so that wasn't an experiment, right? That was just putting data together from the mines and seeing what shook out, but there's experimental data that back up this finding that as the cool season grass seed rate goes up, it gets much more difficult to get shrubs established. So this is a, a study where the grass seed rate was experimentally manipulated in replicated plots. And what we see here is the, the, shrub, the shrubs, the sagebrush here, as the grass seed rate increases, the shrubs go down. So this supports this contention that cool season grasses 
and these are cool season grasses here, uh, as the cool season grass seed rate goes up, shrub abundances decline. This is the same study. Now, or the last slide was two years after seeding. This is six years after seeding. And this is looking at the size of sagebrush plants. Um, at this point in time, there was, no matter what grass seed rate was used, the weed cover was the same. I'm not showing you the weed cover. I'm just showing you the shrub cover, but it was the same regardless. But still, where the grass seed rate was higher, the shrub volume was lower. So this led us to do a bunch of experiments, a re replicate one experiment at a bunch of different places to try to better dial in what a good cool season grass seed rate was. We're trying to find that sweet spot that minimizes weed abundances but allows for higher diversity. <clears throat> so what we did was we at a bunch of sites at these three mines, we manipulated the grass seed rate in plots while holding everything else constant. And the way we did that is we autoclaved the seed. So the, this, when the, we had a quarter of a pound per acre, we autoclaved most of the grass seed to kill it uh, and all the way up to six pounds. So that way we didn't have to recalibrate the cedar all the time because the cedar doesn't know if the grass is dead or not, right? So. Uh, our hypothesis was, with this is that the cool season grass abundances would gradually become similar across seeding dates or seeding rates. And that hypothesis is informed by the last two slides ago, that experiment, but that shrub and forb abundances would be greatest where cool season grass rates were lowest. And here's what we saw in a bunch of these experiments. The this grayish line is two years after seeding, then the yellow line is three years, and the black line is four years. And on the x-axis is the seeding, seeding rate in pounds per acre. And what you'll see is that as we go from gray to yellow to black, the lines flatten, okay? So that is saying that that hypothesis is supported, that the longer we get after seeding, the more independent of the, of the rate of the grasses, cover of grasses becomes, because they're just, they're filling in, they're doing what plants do. So that, the hope there was that that would, by seeding at a lower rate, it would provide a period of low competition for weaker species like shrubs and forbs and warm season grasses to help improve diversity. It didn't work though. Um, here are some data on shrubs, and what we have on the x-axis here is years after seeding. The grass seed rate had no effect on shrub abundances. Uh, but you can see some of these sites, the shrub abundance was, was quite high, particularly in the first growing season, and they tended to decline. You know, and then some, some of the sites hardly had any to begin with. So. But like I say, there was, there was no effect of the grass seed rate treatment on shrub abundances. Here's just more uh, of the same sort of data on shrub, uh, shrubs in other experiments. Same thing with forbs. Same finding with forbs, no effect of grass seed rate on forb density. So why is that? Well. What we have here in the yellow line, the yellow lines are the same as what I showed before, but, but uh, and the black line, so that's cool season grass, seeded grasses, and the black line is annual bromes plus seeded grasses. So whereas we get this gradient in most cases of increasing seeded grass cover with increasing rate, once you add on the annual brome cover, that effect becomes highly attenuated. So the logical explanation is reducing seeded grass cover to give the weaker species an, ability, uh, an opportunity to establish didn't 
lower overall competition because of annual bromes. This is just more of the same. So now we have a new study that we're just starting. We're going to be doing this at nine, at nine locations, uh, Rosebud Mine, Decker Mine, Spring Creek Mine, Absaloka Mine, are the mines that have agreed to, uh, to put in this experiment. We've got three replicates of it in now, and we're going to do six more in the next couple of years. But it, what we're going to be doing is, in addition to having this a gradient of grass, cool season grass seed rates, we're also going to be using herbicides to try to reduce annual, annual grass abundances to see if that provides uh, the reduction in competition needed to get the weaker species going. So in Dazzleflam, that's Rejuver, that's this fairly new herbicide that is, it kills plants as they emerge. So, and it's very good cheatgrass, Japanese brome herbicide. So the idea here is that we'll seed the plots, let the plants, the plants are going to have to deal with whatever weeds are there the first year because if you applied the dazzle flam right then, it would kill the, those plants as they're germinating, right? Because it kills anything as it's germinating. So the idea is let the plants come up the first growing season and then in the fall apply rejuvera, which should pro provide very good cheatgrass control for two or three years. So that's where we're going next with this research. We, with a graduate student a few years back, I, I did a study in failed reclamation. So this is in areas where none of the seeded species came up. What I'm showing you here is that when we used <clears throat> herbicides to reduce cheatgrass and Japanese brome cover, we did we did see some we did see in some cases pretty strong increases in big sage establishment. So this gives me some hope that this combined approach of lowering the grass seed rate, it's lower competition, and 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 implementing weed control will help improve species diversity and shrub establishment, forbush establishment on the mines. So that's talklet one. This talk is going to be very different. And I'll warn you, this is a, this is a tricky talk. Uh, there, there's, you don't need any prerequisites. You, you, you have everything you need to understand it. It's just you got to pay attention because it's just a little bit conceptually dicey. So what I'm going to talk about is the theory behind how densities of plants change as we increase the number of species in the seed mix and change the evenness. Like an even seed mix would be if you seeded all the species at the same pounds per acre. An uneven one would be where they're very different from species to species. So it turns out there's a bunch of things we can say about that that don't take any empiricism at all. They're, they're analytically true. So I'm going to present those bits, and then, there's, then there are some empirical bits that are left over, and I'm going to show you our, our data on the empirical bits. So rangeland restoration is hindered by uncertainty about which varieties and species will best establish. I think we can all appreciate that. We don't know in advance when we're going through the seed catalog uh, which ones are going to do best. To address this uncertainty, we developed the theory regulating effects of seed mix composite, composition on plant densities. And like I said, I'm going to explain the theory, and then we're going to apply the theory to experimental data. So this, by my lights, is what we're doing when we design seed mixes. This is, a, this is a seed catalog. These are three species in a seed catalog, A, B, and C. Very simple seed catalog, three species. Or maybe it's one species, and it's just three varieties of that species. So we're going to assume that we have no knowledge of the survival rate, no knowledge of which ones are going to establish best. 
which is often the case. Okay, and we have three choices. We could decide that we're going to seed one of these species, maybe A or B or C, and allocate all the seed to it, to one, or we could pick two, and these would be the possibilities if we pick two, you have AB, AC, or BC, or we can seed all three of them. So that's step one, which ones are we going to order out of the catalog? And then the next choice is how are we going to allocate the seed rate? Are we going to have it be, let's say we go with this one, or this one, I'm sorry, we're going to have it be one-third, 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 or one-sixth, one-sixth, two-thirds? So those are the two choices. What species we're going to choose? How are we going to allocate the rates once we choose the species? And that seems general to me. There are a couple guarantees. The mean plant density is the same regardless of whether we choose a one species mix at random, a two species mix at random, or a three species mix at random. So when I say the mean, I mean the mean over the choices. The mean over A, B, and C, if you take those three choices, you get three densities, right? The mean of those three densities equals the mean of this, if you did it this way, versus the mean of this, which is a mean of one, because there's only one value then, okay? So, but whereas the mean is constant, the variability among the seed rates, uh, seed mixes goes down as you include more species. So, the upshot of this is with the total and as you seed them more evenly, okay? The variance goes down as the seed more, as you include more species and varieties and as you allocate the rate among them more evenly. The upshot of that is that the total seed, with the total seed rate fixed, and that's the case with everything I'm saying in this talk, we're not varying the seed rate. We're not talking about differently priced seed mixes or different amounts of seed. We're saying with the total seed rate fixed, seeding more species at more even rates reduces the chances of relatively low and relatively high densities. That's another way of saying the variance or the variability, variability goes down. It, the, dense, the variability in density goes down as the number of species increases and they're seeded more evenly is another way, of say, another way of saying that is the likelihood of perilously low densities and very high densities declines as you seed more species. And it's the low densities we gotta care about. If you get a very, very low density in your stand, then that could lead to establishment failure, right? That's, but if you get a moderate or a high density over, over the long term, that tends to generate a similar plant community, whether if, if you have 10 or 15 seedlings per meter square is gonna kind of become the same over time. But if you have one seedling per yard, that could be a problem. So it's the low densities we've got to care about. Uh, this is just to show I did my math. This is what the mean density turns out to be. I said it's the same regardless of the number of species. It's the total seed rate toward times the survival probability. It, uh, the, the, the density is, is much, the, the formula for that is much more complicated. It has to do with the number of species in the catalog. That's what this N is. It has to do with the total, total seed rate has to do with the variance and the survival probabilities amongst the species and a bunch of other things. What I've said so far might seem simplistic because we are often dealing with different plant groups, grasses, forbs, shrubs, uh, or we have different a priori ideas about which species are going to perform best, okay? And or the the species have different costs. And what I'm saying so what I'm saying here is what everything I've said, the guarantees you get. But what are the guarantees? As the number of species goes up, the variance in density goes down. As you see more 
as you allocate the seed rate more evenly, the variance goes down. You get that, those, that, those guarantees on partitions in the seed mix. So this is, let's say that this A, B, and C are grasses and E and F are shrubs. If you allocate the seed rate evenly to all the grasses and another seed rate evenly to both the shrubs, you get the guarantee on the shrubs and you get the guarantee on the grasses. The probability of low grass densities is minimized when you seed all three at an even rate. The same with shrubs. Okay. So everything I said so far is no science. Okay, it's it's these are just analytic truths. There there is some, there, some empiricism would be nice, and I'm going to share some with you, because with this variant, what we said, the variability goes down in the density as the number of species goes up and they're seeded more evenly. But how much it goes down depends on the survival probabilities of the species in the seed catalog, okay? So we did some experiments to quantify the variability in the survival so that we could just see how... How much is the variance going down? How much are we guarding against perilously low densities by increasing the number of species in the seed mix? These are survival probabilities measured two years after seeding in four different experiments. This was done in a, in a farm field where I work in eastern Montana. Uh, so the only thing we were interested in here is getting data on typical survival probabilities of a bunch of different. These are, when it says two, that means there's two varieties of slender wheatgrass. So this is, these are the, the species and the number of varieties we worked with. And uh, these are the kind of calculations we can make based on the survival probabilities. So these calculations have everything to do with what I've shown you earlier in the talk, okay? And I'm explain so these are based on data now. These are, these are real results based on data. And I'm gonna show you how to interpret this. These, this, is, this is a single species example. We had two varieties of western wheatgrass in our study. And the choice we're trying to make here is we're gonna seed two pounds per acre of western wheatgrass. It's a typical one species seed rate, okay? And we have two varieties. We could seed, we could, what, what couldn't we do? We could, we could seed, we could allocate all the seed to one of the varieties, right? Or we could split it between the two. In every, in every case, I'm gonna show you, when we split it amongst more species, we're doing it evenly in these results, okay? So those are the choices. Devote it all to one, split it evenly between two. And what this is saying right here is, what this point four means is that if you pick one at random, that's the one variety, you pick one at random and you devote all the seed to it, there's a 40% chance that you'll have less than 6.7 plants per yard, okay? And that's how you interpret all of these colored boxes. If you decide to buy both western wheat grass varieties in the seed catalog and divide the seed rate evenly among them, there's only a 10% chance you get less than seven plants per meter squared, okay? So the likelihood of low densities declines as you increase the number of varieties in this case. And then I got this circled over here because I just wanted to make sure you understand a little bit about what's going on under the hood before we go on to a more complicated version, version of this. So, oh, I forgot to mention, this is the 2018 experiment, 19 experiment, 20 experiment, 21 experiment, okay? So what this one is saying here is in 2020, if you pick one variety, well, let me just tell you this in advance. One of the two varieties didn't establish at all that year. Okay, in 2020. And if you pick that one and devote all of the seed to it, there's a 50, so there's a 50% chance that you're gonna choose the loser and you end up with zero. 
right? So if you choose them both and evenly allocate half the seed to each, then there's zero chance that you'll end up with zero, okay? So that's how these calculations are run. Uh, and I'm going to go into a little bit more complicated version in this next slide that involves multiple species. But this is pretty good evidence that you can guard against perilously low densities within individual species by seeding more varieties. So I can show you a lot of data because, you know, the four, four years of experiments with lots of species, but I'm just going to show you data from one of the experiments, the 2000 18 experiment. The reason it says Montana here is because we also did a bunch of these same experiments in California with a bunch of different species there. But, okay, so a typical heuristic that you'll hear is five plants per meter squared is a good start a couple years after seeding. Okay, so that's why I got that we're working around this, this five here. Okay, that's a good start. If you're getting five seedlings per meter squared, that's promising. So what this is saying, and, the, and this is our total grass seed rate here, okay? So we're gonna, what we're doing here is we're allocating the total seed rate to amongst these 22 varieties of, what are there, eight species. If we pick one, one, at random, and assign all of the seed to it, there is an 80% chance that the density will be below five plants per meter squared, okay? If we, and these numbers go down, as you increase the number of randomly selected varieties and species that you're including. So we get down here to eight, and there's zero chance that you're gonna be below five plants per meter squared. So more species, more varieties, less chance of perilously low Densities is the take home there. I don't know what I, why I included that slide, I don't know. Uh, but uh, we'll move on to this one, because I do know why I included this one. So this is the a, a, priori, a priori guarantee. I told you with math, but in case you didn't believe me, I'll show you with data now. This, we are guaranteed to see this in advance of doing any kind of experimentation. If we choose one at random, the probability of being below 1.8 plants per meter squared is 0.7, but there's also a 10% a chance that the density is greater than 16, okay? But if you seed all 22, then the, all the probability is confined to this much smaller range. The probability of perilously low densities and of very high densities declines as the number of species is increased. Often we have pre-existing knowledge about which one plants are going to do best. So this is to demonstrate that this approach to designing seed mix isn't, isn't too naive to be useful. If there's ways to use this approach if you have the prior knowledge. So we, a priori, suspected that these species would not perform as well as these do, okay? So now what we did, this is exactly, this is exactly what I showed you a couple slides ago, same panel. But now we say, okay, we're not going to seed any of these. We're going to allocate all of our seed to these four. And, and, and uh, what you can see here is the value of prior information. If we include all of them as potential candidates, there's an 80% chance, if you pick one at random, 80% chance you're less than 5.4 plants per meter squared, as I showed you before. But now if we get rid of all these and focus our attention on these, now there's only a 50% chance that if you pick one at random that you're below 5.4. And, you know, these numbers are all smaller than the corresponding numbers up here. So this demonstrates the value of prior knowledge, and it demonstrates that even 
the knowledge breaks down at some point. Um, the knowledge breaks down, so meaning that we didn't we don't have any way of adjudicating between these four, okay? We based on our experience and our knowledge of the species, and so even when we're working with this four, including more, reduces the the chances of low densities more. I got a lot of, oh, I'm going backwards now, sorry. So anyway, we should be seeding as many species and varieties as is practically possible. And if I was designing seed mixes, I would, if, if I'm going through the seed catalog and there's three varieties, I'd, I'd get one third, I'd devote all, this one third of the seed to each of them. And we should always be erring on the side of having more species in the seed mix to, again, guard against the, the likelihood of perilously low densities. Um, thank you. All right, thanks, Matt. Any, any questions for Matt? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It's something I should look at. I, I didn't. I didn't. I would have to measure the soil or the soils or, or get get data from the mine on the soils. But I haven't looked at that. I suspect that a lot of that is is has to do with the precipitation the year they were seeded. Um, there was one year that we got way more. All the experiments that were seeded one year had more shrubs than, than the other years, you know, so. Was it guarded against, like, predators? No. Animals? No. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not catching this. To your, did you see volunteer desirable plants along with, of course, weeds happening? Uh, and yeah. did, did, did that enter into your calculations? Um, okay, in in the first talk with the with the, where I'm showing those uh, with the forbs and the shrubs, yes, some of those may have been not seeded uh, with the with those grass where I'm showing how the cover changes across seed rates over time those are just focused on just the seeded grasses but yeah some of the forbs and shrubs could have been from not not from the seed mix yeah more questions oh, in yeah the back there Now it's on. Um, so I'm, I'm with Ruby Graphite, and we're going to be getting into uh, uh, reclamation as well eventually. But one of the first things we have to deal with is eradication of the invasive, invasive species that are out there. And so I'm, I'm wondering if uh, you know, putting down herbicides uh, to, to kill these invasive species is going to impact uh, the reseeding and how you deal with that in, in the best way. So you're saying before you're wanting to kill, you're, you're considering applying herbicides to kill the weeds before you remove the soil, before you disturb the area? We're supposed to uh, eradicate the invasive species across uh, about 2,000 acres. That's, that's what our permit asks us to do. Before, and you're saying you're do, this would be something you are going to do before you disturb the area? We want to start actively doing that this year. Yeah. But we, we probably wouldn't be doing any reclamation until next year or the, the year after. Yeah, I, well, I don't, I, I don't think that you're going to negatively impact your ability to reclaim the areas by doing weed management in advance. Okay. 
I, I, you, you probably will probably be doing yourself a favor because you're going to have this what, soil that's going to be stockpiled and then redistributed if you could get a handle on the weeds mm -hmm. before it goes into the stockpile. It seems like you'd be a step ahead. I mean, I'm, I'm just shooting off the cup, but I don't think you have to hurt, worry about herbicide residual preventing your plants from establishing down the road. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Matt. We appreciate it. Yeah. Good talk.